Greetings and peace and welcome this beautiful spring day to our Lord's house. We hope you feel the love and warmth of our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as we worship here today. It is so nice to see everyone. I'm seeing everyone today, and it's a wonderful thing to see the church packed. Today, during our service, I'm going to share two prayers that, uh, that were written after World War I during our last calamity, the Spanish flu. So those will be added today. Our, our Lenten ash on our forehead is growing dim. It's very light today as this is our last Wednesday of Lent. Sunday will be Palm Sunday and next week, of course, Holy Week. But our ashes are still there, indicating our journey. Let us pray. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Turn us again, O God of our salvation that the light of your face may shine on us. May your justice shine like the sun, and may the poor be lifted up. O oh God, merciful and compassionate, you are ever ready to hear the prayers of those who put their trust in you. Graciously come to us who call upon you and grant us your help in this our need. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please join me as we say Psalm 130 in unison together. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. If you were to keep watch over sins, O Lord, who could stand? Yet with you is forgiveness in order that you may be feared. I wait for you, O Lord, my soul waits. In your word is my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who keep watch for the morning, more than those who keep watch for the morning. O Israel, wait for the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love. With the Lord there is plenteous redemption. For the Lord shall redeem Israel from all their sins. A reading from Isaiah, chapter 53, verses 11 and 12. My servant shall put the righteous in the right for many, and their crimes he shall bear. Therefore I will give him shares among the many, and with the mighty he shall share our spoils. For he laid himself bare to death and was counted among the wrongdoers, and it is he who bore the offense of many and interceded for the wrongdoers. The word of the Lord. A reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verses 28 through 30. 
After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A bowl full of vinegar stood there, so they put a sponge full of vinegar on hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had re received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The Gospel of the Lord. May my words be in harmony with the universe, contribute to its justice, enhance its beauty, and lead us all to peace on the earth. Amen. Today we have the final request. It is also our last day with the suffering servant. We conclude chapter 53, and we have an interesting perspective change here in that it starts, my servant, that is, God, not the disciple, is speaking here. My servant. But the idea of the servant having borne the sins of many continues. Therefore, I will give him shares among the many. Again, perplexing, because the servant is dead. He laid himself bare to death. This appears to reiterate the, the fact that he is dead. And I can't help but notice the word bare, which can have a couple of meanings, but I can't help to think of someone on a cross, bare. So is this a posthumous restoration of reputation? Or is it a posthumous acceptance of prophecy? Or is it to a reward in the afterlife? And this is an idea that was blossoming at the time of Deutero-Isaiah. This idea was coming to fruition the idea of a reward in an afterlife. Finally, the poem describes the purpose of God's people, the covenant community. This is the important theme of Deutero Isaiah and the suffering servant. We go to another suffering servant in John, who says, I thirst. I thirst is a single word in Greek. Dipsio. Dipsio is the word used in the Gospels. It's also a single word in Aramaic. Dipsio in John means to thirst. But as with many Greek words, it has some subtlety because it can be thirst literally or figuratively. Well, without a doubt, our Lord meant it. He thirsted. The strife he had gone through for the past 24 hours, his last drink undoubtedly was the night before, perhaps at that last supper that he shared with the disciples. He's now been hanging on a cross for six hours in the scorching sun. He is sweating. He is bleeding. He is bent, contorted, and struggling to breathe. Without a doubt, our Lord meant it. I thirst. 
Dipseo appears six times in the Gospel of John. I think that certainly qualifies as a theme in the book of John. And two times in the Gospel readings, wine appears at the crucifixion. One of those times is in Matthew, where we come across the gall and find Jesus curiously mute still. Matthew 27, 34 says, They offered him wine to drink, mingled with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. Gall. It was a narcotic. and It was used to ease pain. And when our Lord tasted it, he refused. He was going to accept all possible pain. A similar story is told in Matthew, Matt, or Mark, sorry, Mark 15, 23. And they offered him wine mingled with myrrh, but he did not take it. Myrrh, or perhaps frankincense, often they would take a pinch of each and put it in the wine, again, as a narcotic. And he did not take it. You see, both myrrh and frankincense, and we know where we've heard of those two before, myrrh and frankincense were used medicinally, specifically to help with inflammation. But our Lord refused. Matthew and Mark Their story of wine at the crucifixion happens at the beginning of the crucifixion. John's is at the end. Similar, but no. The scripture says, For my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Sour wine, that is, vinegar. It's offered to Jesus when he says he thirsts. The Greek word is oxos for vinegar. But here, perhaps more important, is the Latin. The Latin word is posca. That's the name of the drink, this sour wine vinegar drink. And it was carried by the soldiers of the Roman Empire. It was the drink of these soldiers. And they mixed it with water because the water everywhere that they were at was undoubtedly poor, horrible. And they thought that it killed the bacteria. Uh, Maybe it did. But one thing it did do, it slaked their thirst. And so they carried it with them. And they found a hyssop. And they put some of this vinegar on a sponge, put it on the hyssop so that they could reach up to Jesus' mouth so that he could drink of Pascha. I always remember as a kid thinking, wow, that's a lot of stuff that just happened to be there at the site of this execution. A lot of stuff to have hanging around. But sponges were used by the Roman soldiers. They were always with the Roman soldiers. Sponges were found all along the Mediterranean basis, a basin which was the Roman Empire. And they used these sponges for drinking, but they also used them in their helmets. The helmets, as you might imagine, were very heavy. And they would put them in their helmets to protect their head as they marched with these heavy helmets. And this is the sponge that Jesus was offered. On hyssop. The other Gospels 
say it was a reed. John is specific. It's hyssop. Why hyssop in John? It was a very aromatic plant, very beautiful bluish flowers. But I think in John, its symbolism is what's important. You see, hyssop was used by the high priest at the purification of the tabernacle. So here we have it again. Last week we had the high priest in this garment that had no seams. And today we have hyssop that the high priest uses at the purification of the temple, the tabernacle, the holy of holies, where God is. It was also used at the Exodus. The Israelites were told to take a lamb with very specific instructions of how to eat that lamb. But the blood of that lamb was to be placed on the lentil of their doors, over the top of their doors, and they were to place a tav. Kind of looks like a cross, doesn't it? That is the ancient Hebrew tav. And that's what was placed on the door so that the angel of death could pass over a tav in the blood of a lamb. That cross, that last letter in the ancient alphabet, has meaning in the Hebrew. It, it, it stands for something. And what it stands for is truth. That tav stands for truth. But not just any truth. Truth that is only found at the end of a journey. So, Matthew and Mark share their wine story at the beginning John shares his at the end of that journey. I thirst. An expression of the dehydration of Jesus' humanity. And my tongue cleaves to my jaws. Jesus does not drink to slake his thirst. Jesus drinks so that he may utter his last words. His last request is to proclaim the accomplished. It is accomplished. There is the truth at the end of the journey. He has done everything he came to do. Many commentators and theologians both emphasize that we should not spiritualize these words, I thirst, which usually happens. Jesus thirsts for us. He thirsts for our souls, for our redemption. Many say we should not do that. I'll follow that today. But instead, I'm going to flip the metaphor. We thirst. An expression of the dehydration of our humanity. We thirst for the spiritual. And it's an understanding of the incarnation. Jesus' humanity is our humanity, and we thirst. Consider a couple of those dipseo passages in John. Consider John 4.14. This is the woman at the well that 
we read about a few weeks ago. He says to her, but whoever drinks of this water will never thirst. Later, in the sixth chapter, at the 35th verse, he's at the Sea of Galilee. He's found his way across the the Sea of Galilee without any help. His disciples are confused by this. But he says, He who believes in me shall never thirst. And finally, in John 7, John 7, 37, Jesus is at the Feast of the Tabernacles, Pharisees all around him. And if he says, if anyone thirsts, let them come to me. An interesting progression, an interesting trip, an interesting journey. Because our thirst goes from the water that slakes the thirst to the faith in Jesus that provides all that we need to slake our thirst. And then it calls us to action, to do something with our thirst. We thirst. Bring your sponge, Jesus. Amen. With confidence in God's grace and mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Let us give thanks for God's blessings to us, especially today. In these days, be with our patience. Help us to Sabbath daily. God of love, hear our prayer. Let us bring before God needs and concerns known to us. In these days, let us pray for Zeta Bates, Glenda Dugan, Betty Wilkin, and Jay Seward. Let us share our sympathy and prayers for the departed, David Doyle, Laura Dobrowski, Rachel Lackey, and Glenn Schwab. God of love, hear our prayer. Let us bring before God our needs. In these days, Be with your church, a church without a building. Be with us. We are the church. Let us ask God's guidance and blessing upon our time together. In these days, let us love one another and uphold one one another responsibly. God of love, hear our prayer. Jesus said, you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. I chose you and appointed you to bear fruit that will last. Remember, I will be with you always, to the end of time. The Lord be with you. Let us pray.
O most mighty and merciful God, in this time of grievous sickness, we flee to you for strength. Deliver us, we beseech you, from our peril. Give strength and skill to all those who minister to the sick. Prosper the means made use for their cure, and grant that, perceiving how frail and uncertain our life is, we may apply our hearts to the heavenly wisdom that leads to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, grant that your holy word, which has been proclaimed this day, may enter into our hearts through your grace, that it may produce in us the fruit of the Spirit for witness and service into the world and to the praise and honor of your name, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us praise, bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve us. Amen.